If you're wondering what the highest paid doctors are, I'm here to provide you with comprehensive lists of the highest paid medical specialties in the United States and Canada. Plus, I'll explain the intricate system of how doctors get paid and what factors influence physicians' income. Hi, my name is Joseph Kafka, and I'm an admissions associate here at BMO. Before we get started, be sure to subscribe to whatever social media channel you're watching this from so you don't miss out on any of our upcoming videos. If you would like us to help you get into your top choice residency program, click on the link above or below this video to schedule your free initial consultation. And as a quick tip, check out the timestamps in the description of this video to navigate the specific sections of the video that you're interested in. When it comes to the highest paid doctor, here's everything we're going to cover in this video. What is the highest paid doctor in the US? How do doctors get paid in the US? Private practice versus employed. Income difference by state. Income difference by specialty. DO versus MD. What is the highest paid doctor in Canada? How do doctors get paid in Canada? And final thoughts. Now let's get started. It's very difficult to calculate the average annual income of a US physician. Not only does income depend on the doctor's specialty, but it's also affected by a variety of factors, such as the state where they practice and their employment status. For example, do they have their own practice or are they employed by a medical facility or institution? At BMO, we've compiled lists of medical specialties in the US and Canada with the highest annual income based on several sources, including Medscape, LinkedIn, Indeed, and the Canadian Institute for Health Information. The highest paid medical specialties in the US so far are orthopedics and plastic surgery and the lowest paid doctors are in pediatrics and public health and prevention. This is an extremely complicated question. It is especially difficult to determine and articulate how doctors get paid in the United States. As mentioned already, their income is dependent on many factors, including employment status, state of practice, and of course, specialty. Additionally, the healthcare landscape in the United States is constantly changing with the introduction of new bills, laws, and other institutional changes, such as the Affordable Care Act. With that though, let's review the different factors that determine a doctor's income in the United States. Latest statistics show that self-employed physicians earn more than employed physicians, with self-employed physicians earning an average of 395,000 annually and employed physicians earning 289,000 annually. According to a report by the American Medical Association, AMA, the main difference in how doctors get paid lies in ownership status. The difference is not in income per se, but how doctors earn their living. For example, physicians employed in hospitals, medical centers, and other similar institutions cite salary as their main mode of compensation. Whereas private professionals can also get paid in salary, but the number of self-employed doctors who are paid by salary is much lower. According to the AMA report, over 46% of employed doctors indicate that more than half of their income is based on salary, while only 25.6% of the owners indicate the same. The compensation of private physicians tends to rely on their personal productivity. However, this is not to say that an employed physician's income does not depend on productivity. It does, but much less than their private counterparts' income. As expected, financial performance was only important in the compensation of private physicians, but only 10% of private practice owners indicated that it was the sole factor in determining their income. So how do private physicians get paid? As with any private business owner, a self-employed doctor's personal income can be determined after all the other business expenses are paid. The doctor's office sees patients, documents their visits, bills the patients or their insurance companies, and receives a flow of revenue. So let's say a doctor's office made $350,000 in one year. The cost of running the business is $200,000 a year. Rent, employee salaries, supplies, leases, etc. This means that the owner or owners of the practice are left with $150,000 in income, which is then shared between them. It's in the best interest of private practices then to serve as many patients per day as possible. Their revenue heavily depends on the number of patients they see per day and bill per day. Simply put, if the number of patients goes down, so does the revenue of a private doctor's office. However, in recent years, private practice has become less popular with physicians in the US. According to recent data from the AMA, 
only 47.1% of physicians in America remain in private practice. Let's examine the reasons for this. Running a business as a physician is no simple task. Most doctors get frustrated and tired of the regulations and responsibilities of managing a multi-million dollar enterprise. According to the latest research, 26% of physicians polled stated that rules and regulations of the healthcare system are the most challenging part of their job. On top of dealing with employees and paying rent, they have to deal with their patients' insurance companies and Medicare, as well as malpractice insurance companies covering their business. For many, becoming an employee of a hospital provides peace of mind and a stable income. And even though employed physicians are also expected to demonstrate high productivity, their salaries are technically not dependent on it. Yet this too is overly simplistic. US hospitals have created a protection for reduced physician productivity. Many hospitals in the United States have created different pay packages for their employed physicians. This way, the hospitals try to reward hard work performed by their doctors. The work relative value unit system attempts to compensate physicians for extra work or demonstrated enthusiasm, such as seeing more patients. In this way, the model of revenue and income of private practices is also present in larger institutions. The more patients the doctor serves, the higher his or her pay is. Currently, many healthcare systems in the United States are looking to change their pay structures to adapt to certain Medicare rules. But it's difficult to imagine that the US healthcare system will move away from rewarding physicians based on the number of patients they see. However, a lot of attention is also being paid to quality and efficiency which means that the value of care delivery will also consider more than the number of patients served. As you can imagine, it is extremely difficult to find this balance. As with all business models, pay in healthcare is mostly dependent on productivity. The shift in healthcare compensation hopes to align pure productivity with quality of care. The state where a doctor practices also influences a doctor's income. You would think that the states with the largest populations would see the highest incomes for doctors, but this is not the case. Interestingly, states like New York and California do not even crack the top 10 states with the highest physician's income. This may be due to several factors. Large and economically developed states like New York and California offer an abundance of healthcare options, which means that patients have a lot of options when it comes to choosing their healthcare provider. As I already pointed out, the US healthcare system is built around earnings based on the number of patients served, which is why states with large populations and abundant healthcare options have a lower average income per physician, while states like Kentucky, Tennessee, and Alabama are some of the highest earning states for physicians overall. Healthcare options are more limited in these states, such as not as many doctors, hospitals, private practices, and other medical facilities. This means that there are more patients per doctor than in New York, for example. Perhaps this explains why the average salary of a physician in Kentucky is higher. They serve more patients than their counterpart in New York, where there is more competition for patients. Now, here are the top 10 earning states for physicians in the US. Kentucky at 346,000, Tennessee at 338,000, Florida at 333,000, Alabama at 332,000, Utah at 328,000, Ohio at 326,000, Indiana at 326,000, Oklahoma at 326,000, North Carolina at 325,000, and Georgia at 323,000. You can head over to our blog to see for yourself and check out the tables and lists. On average, Primary care practitioners in the US earn 297,000, while specialists earn 357,000. The real question is why does specialty determine a doctor's income? Simply put, some specialties require more skill and therefore more training. For example, surgical specialties such as orthopedics, cardiology, radiology, and plastic surgery are some of the highest paid specialties in the US. These specialties are procedure based and require five or six years of additional residency training after graduation from medical school. These specialties also tend to demand post-residency subspecialty training, such as fellowships. Therefore, these specialties get paid more. Primary care specialties, such as family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, and so forth, require less training. One can become a practicing family physician after six years of medical education and training. 
Therefore, physicians practicing in these specialties earn less. The upside is that they have smaller school debt and enter the workforce quicker by spending less time and money on specialty training. When it comes to specialty, you should also consider the demand in the healthcare field. An increase in salary or earnings based on specialty often foreshadow a shortage in that specialty. While DO and MD physicians make comparable money when they practice in the same specialty, specialty options are a little bit more limited for DO physicians. According to the latest Maine residency match data, DO and MD graduates are equally competitive for primary care specialties like family medicine. However, DOs are less represented in those lucrative surgical specialties I talked about. For example, 23 MD seniors managed to match a dermatology residency, one of the most competitive residencies in the US, while only six DO seniors match this same specialty. Another example is orthopedic surgery, with 686 MDs matching versus 112 DOs matching this specialty. And while there's still a discrepancy in the numbers, you should know that there has been a big increase in DO representation in surgical competitive specialties. This is mostly due to the change in the accreditation of residency programs. Previously, osteopathic and allopathic residencies were accredited by different institutions. Osteopathic residency was accredited by the American Osteopathic Association, AOA, and allopathic residencies were accredited by the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, ACGME. Now, both DO and MD programs are accredited by the ACGME, which gives osteopathic residency programs the same status and opportunities as allopathic programs. Additionally, the same accreditation system allows DOs to participate in MD programs, and for MDs to participate in programs with osteopathic recognition designation. Simply put, the unified accreditation system is closing the gap between DO versus MD residents. With time, the difference in numbers between DO and MD residents will likely shrink. However, remember what DO stands for. Don't forget that DOs do have a particular philosophy that leads them to pursue primary, non-intrusive medical care specialties. While DOs are certainly capable of becoming surgeons, their tenants still affect their choice in specialties and where they practice. This means that the difference between DO and MD salaries may remain. Let's review the highest average gross clinical payments by physician specialty in Canada. To calculate the average gross clinical payments made to physicians by provincial or territorial healthcare systems, the Canadian Institute for Health Information, CIH, divides the sum of all gross clinical payments, that's fee for service information and alternative payments by the total number of physicians in a specialty. The two highest paid doctors specialize in ophthalmology and thoracic cardiovascular surgery, with the two lowest paid specialties being psychiatry and family medicine. You can see the full list on our website. I just want to emphasize that this is gross income. Most physicians in Canada, especially those working fee for service, work as independent contractors running their own small business. So all the costs associated with having a small business are taken out of this gross income. Therefore, the take-home pay can be notably less. A big chunk of this gross income goes to liability insurance, which all physicians must have. The cost for liability insurance varies by specialty, as do overhead costs. They can be anywhere from 20 to 60%. Also note that such physicians do not get taxes deducted, paid parental leave, vacation benefits of any kind, or retirement contributions. The first thing you need to know is that Canada does not have many private healthcare institutions. Unlike the US, Canada has a universal healthcare system with a unified payment system for each of the provinces and territories as healthcare remains the prerogative of provincial governments. Each province oversees its own healthcare system and payments. The income of physicians in Canada certainly depends on the province where they practice. Most Canadian physicians are paid based on the services they provide. The fee-for-service program, FFS, amounts to 73% of payments made to physicians by their province or territorial healthcare systems. These services are typically divided into two categories, consultations slash visits and procedures. Generally, procedures have higher fees than consultations or counseling, but this is slowly shifting to prioritize preventative care. Even though primary care physicians like family doctors perform the greatest number of services and receive the largest portion of the healthcare budget, physicians in other specialties, especially surgery, earn more because their services cost more. 
For example, the average cost per family physician service is about $50, while a service by a neurosurgeon costs $250. Additionally, the CIH also considers alternative clinical payments in their calculations, such as salary, sessional positions, capitation, and so forth. This kind of compensation varies by province. Another model of payment in Canada is alternative plans. For example, in Alberta, these are called Alternative Remuneration Plans, ARPs. Generally, these combine fee-for-service with some fixed income and help compensate physicians who teach or do research. Typically, when a physician becomes an instructor for residents, they see fewer patients, as time is taken by teaching. However, to encourage teaching, this is balanced with some fixed payment in combination with FFS billing. Choosing a specialty, employment status, or state or province in which to practice based on money is not wise. Remember, money cannot sustain your dedication and passion for medicine. If you're planning to become a physician in the United States, in many ways, your personality and experiences will determine not only your specialty, but your employment status. While some enjoy the autonomy and self-direction of owning a private practice, many doctors prefer the stability and steady income that employment provides. While it's difficult to make accurate calculations about what is the highest paid doctor, there's no denying that physicians are some of the highest paid traditional professionals in North America. When you consider physicians' incomes, you should keep in mind how long it takes to become a doctor. It is a huge investment of your time, money, effort, and mental health. Most doctors continue paying off their medical school debt long after they graduate, so their generous incomes help them repay what they owe. In addition to debt, the vocation of a physician is not for the faint of heart. It involves duties and responsibilities most of us cannot imagine. And while there are a lot of challenges associated with being a doctor, the latest survey done by Medscape demonstrates that 77% of physicians polled would choose medicine again if they were still deciding on a career path. This wraps up our video for today. Check out our blog to learn more about the highest paid doctors, including frequently asked questions and utilize our lists. I have included a link in the description of this video so you can find the blog easily. If you would like us to help you get into your top choice residency program, click on the link above or below this video to schedule your free initial consultation. Hopefully you enjoyed this video, so please subscribe, like, and leave a comment. Speaking of comments, if you have any questions about the highest paid doctors that I didn't cover in this video, let me know in the comment section and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thanks so much for watching and see you next time.